Welcome, thanks for coming. My name is John. I'm the project technical lead for Swift, and this is the Swift project update for this summit. So thank you. If this is where you want to be, great. If it's not, you'll learn something today. So uh, I, this update is going to be slightly different than some of the ones I've given in the past. Uh, the, uh, but I think you'll see that um, as I go through this. There's going to be plenty of opportunity for questions, but in a lot of times in previous updates, I have given, uh, said, okay, here's the big things that we've been doing, here's uh, kind of what's going on. And if you remember correctly, the, uh, the, the project update I gave, I gave six months ago in Vancouver, I was talking about some massive, massive, massive new features that had just landed. Turns out after you do a huge amount of massive new features, you don't also have queued up another huge set of massive features to talk about six months later. But what we do have some things to talk about, but the really cool thing is I get to talk about what those, the impact of those features has been in various production of deployments. And I think that's gonna be kind of fun. So there's plenty of time for question, plenty of times for uh, feedback, and we can, we can go back and forth. I think there's a mic here and I'll also repeat questions for the video. So all that being said, um, welcome. Uh, I want to start off always by not assuming that anybody knows everything to start with. So what is Swift? Swift is an object storage system. And the whole point of Swift is to abstract away the storage media from the data that you're actually storing on it. So that as an application developer, you can only think about here's some bytes to give to my storage system and I'd like to get those back at some point. So you write data and you read data, but you don't have to think about the hard problems of storage. Your application only has to worry about what are, the application can worry about making the application great. It doesn't have to think about concurrency of access. It doesn't have to think about optimization of uh, throughput and locking and uh, overwrites and failures in your media and working around those and durably storing things, keeping them available. All of those sort of things is what Swift handles for you. On the operator side, the advantage of this design means that it gives the operators a way to more easily manage a large and growing storage cluster. As it, as it continues to grow, you can continue to add capacity where you need it. So, Overall, this design gives you, and the whole point of Swift is to give you very durable storage that is massively scalable and uh, uh, supports a very, very large amount of aggregate concurrent throughput. And that's what we make. Swift API looks like this. Uh, all the requests are basic HTTP uh, verbs and response codes. And there are three key parts of a Swift request. There's the account, the container, and the object. The account is something akin to a bank account. It's not necessarily tied one-to-one -to, -one to a particular end user. It's a place where you put stuff, and that's it. Just like your own bank account. You put things in there, hopefully you take out less than you put in, and you uh, sometimes give somebody else access to it, and that's fine. So you put data in there, it's just a place where you store things. The container in Swift is these days unfortunately named uh, because of some other little technology that was invented after Swift. And, uh, but it is a subdivision of your account namespace. And uh, this is very similar to Amazon's S3 buckets. So the container is analogous to a bucket. And so uh, these days we kind of go back and forth between calling it a container and a bucket really just depending on who we're talking to. And then finally, you've got the object, which is where you actually store the data. And uh, if, you're, if you're storing backups, if you're storing movies, if you're storing cat pictures, whatever the case may be, uh, that, that goes there. But this gives you a very flat namespace where uh, you uh, can uh, support multi-tenancy, whereas in I can have an account and you can have an account and we can name things. We can, we can each have a container called photos and that's totally fine. And inside of our respective photos containers, we can each have a cat.jpg, and there's no over, overlap or overwrite or contention on that. So it makes it, uh, this design makes it really easy for you to code against as an application developer, uh, and you'll see those three parts, the account container and object reflected throughout the overall design of the system uh, the deeper you look. When you put it into a production cluster, basically this is what it looks like. Uh, you've got a client who normally talks to a load balancer uh, that is uh, fronting 
uh, some what we call proxy servers. The proxy servers are the API endpoints, and the, AP and the proxy servers talk to the storage nodes. The storage nodes are the ones that have hard drives plugged into them. The proxy server is responsible for taking that request, implementing most of the API, and then choosing the right, uh, the right storage servers to talk to to be able to read or write the data and working around failures and all of that and making sure that the proper response code is sent back um, to, the, uh, uh, to the client. So the cool thing about this is it's very modular. Each of these pieces are stateless, which means that they can come and go and the load, the aggregate load is handled by the, remaining, uh, the remainder that are still in the cluster. And it also means you can add new stuff where you need it. So if you need more network throughput, you can add proxy servers. If you need more storage capacity, you can add more storage servers, and you don't have to add them in predefined size chunks uh, up front. So you need more, you can add more exactly where you need it, and you don't have to, uh, these, these kind of things was what I was saying earlier about uh, making it easier for the operators to grow and scale and manage their cluster. So that's a quick overview of what Swift is. And now that we're all caught up and understand exactly what Swift is, let's talk about the state of the project. So what is it that we've uh, done? Uh, Swift is one of the oldest projects in OpenStack, one of the two founding projects. So uh, we've been doing these a very long time. And uh, last time in Vancouver, we had just released uh, Swift version 2.18.0. And it was the biggest release we had ever done in Swift. Uh, it had three major new things in it. Uh, the first one is that we added something called container sharding, which is a way to take these containers, these logical containers that you see in the API, and uh, split them behind the scenes so that as the individual container grows, the container stores uh, some metadata and a listing of what is inside of it uh, for pagination, uh, paginating uh, what's actually in there so you can uh, discovery on, on your objects. As you add more and more and more objects into a container, we have hundreds of millions to billions of objects, the uh, storage requirements for that single container get very large and can, in fact, exceed the storage availability on a single hard drive. So it's important to split, uh, to split those up and store it throughout the rest of the cluster. So you have the entirety of the capacity of the cluster being able to uh, share the load for a particular container. So what we implemented was a way that transparently does that with no downtime for the end user and an, op an operator-initiated container sharding. Uh, massive feature took about four years to design, implement, test, and release. It alone made up about 10% of the total code base today. Uh, so it's just absolutely massive. And that wasn't the only big thing that we did. We also released uh, or reintegrated uh, S3 API compatibility layer into Swift so that anyone who is automatically deploying uh, Swift out of the box by default can have an S3 API uh, uh, endpoint that works and talks to your Swift cluster. So you can use either the Swift API or the S3 API. And the great thing about this is, of course, there are so many uh, applications that are already out there that are written with uh, using the S3 API to speak to an object's uh, storage system, and so we can support that. This used to be a project that was maintained in, uh, in, the, in the ecosystem uh, of OpenStack, but not inside of the Swift code base, and so we migrated into the Swift code base so that as, as we as developers, as we continue to add new features, as we continue to uh, do tests, we make sure we don't introduce regressions, and we make sure that the new features, especially things that are are done on uh, like uh, client-facing changes, uh, we make sure that we're considering the S3 API as a first-class citizen on those. And then the third thing we did was some back-end uh, performance improvements uh, for some of the consistency demons that are running things that make sure that the right data is in the right place uh, at the right time, and it, it, it's what allows the storage servers to uh, remain healthy uh, overall that they uh, do that. So I wanna go through each of these and then talk about some of the new things that we've been doing. So the first one is uh, the container sharding. So you take a giant database and you split it up and uh, uh, into a lot of smaller uh, databases that are distributed throughout the cluster. This has been an amazing success. It has, it has worked wonderfully. 
the only thing that we have come across at all so far is occasionally after it's done doing this, there's a default config uh, uh, tuning parameter that may be a little bit too low and uh, it, it uses up some extra CPU while it's waiting to find new things to, new databases to shard. Um, and that's it, it's, it's continued to work. Uh, while clusters stay up, while people are uh, actively using uh, these particular containers. And I've seen it used in quite a few different places, uh, in different, different production clusters. The biggest database that I know of, that the size of the database before it started, before we initiated container sharding, was, I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 400 million objects inside of that row, inside of that database. Uh, and we were able to uh, start sharding. It was taken care of in the background. It goes relatively quickly. Uh, the moving that amount of data around can be kind of slow, especially keeping it consistent throughout the uh, system. But in general, it seems on that kind of order of magnitude size, it seems to, it, you're measuring it in a small number of days that uh, you, you initiate container sharding and then everything is settled out and, and fixed. Uh, less than a week, maybe just uh, two or three days. So it, it works actually pretty well. The biggest single database that I know of, container that I know of, uh, that has been charted at all, uh, has approximately three billion objects in it. Uh, fortunately, we discovered that it was going to have three billion objects in it way before it had three billion objects in it to start with. So it, was, it merely had one or 200 million at the time, and uh, this was uh, in conjunction with uh, some people importing and, and migrating uh, from a different storage system into Swift. And uh, so we started doing some analysis on the, the remaining data and realized we've got a number that's gonna be three billion later. Uh, let's go ahead and initiate sharding. We were able to uh, pre-shard essentially or, or shard what was already there. And then as it continued to grow, you can uh, allow it to continue, or you can continue to uh, shard anything that gets bigger, but it was, again, done in a live production environment with no client impact or downtime at all. So that was, it's, it's been tremendously successful and I'm really happy with, with how well that's worked. With the other uh, major big feature that we did last time, we were talking about the S3 API. Um, it's harder to say that here's exactly what we have seen because it's really just now we have more client applications talking to us and this is uh, you, you can see anecdotal evidence about, oh, well, I was using this, or you talk to somebody else and say, we already have something that speaks S3, can we talk to Swift? And you just say yes, and the conversation's over. Uh, so it's not quite as dramatic of numbers or things like that. However, there are a few things that are uh, rather interesting. Uh, I know that there was a, um, a small bit of news uh, maybe, maybe a month or so ago uh, about how uh, Splunk can talk to Swift clusters using the S3 API. And this is hugely important for people who are using Splunk for all of their indexing and, and analytics stuff that they're doing with that system. And uh, it means that they can automatically use Swift as a way to store all of their warm indexes, the things that are not the, the super high performance stuff right now, but you don't have to ever offload those to um, unavailable storage. And you can continue to use them with uh, you have access to all of your data without having to sacrifice, uh, I can't store this anymore because it's not as recent. And it turns out when you have access to all of that data, even the long tail of the historic data, uh, you can start making some very in interesting decisions and discoveries about what's actually happening. So you can get a huge amount of extra benefit without uh, having to compromise on that storage space because Splunk can talk directly to Swift via the S3 API. So that's, I've seen in, uh, a few other uh, software projects that have been able to start talking to Swift and have, uh, have uh, played with that a little bit. Um, so that's, again, where we're seeing success with people using the S3 API to talk to Swift itself. We do have some plans uh, to continue to improve this in the future. Uh, a few of the things that we will probably be adding within the relative near term, but let's just say by the time we all reconvene in the, at the next summit in Denver, um, I would expect these to be done would include uh, a, uh, uh, this is the S3 versioning is the, the Swift has versioning uh, a couple different ways actually to be able to uh, store historic copies of your data as they're overwritten. 
and S3 has yet a different way to do that uh, if, you, if you're talking to AWS. And their API for doing so is subtly different than the way that Swift works. So being able to expose that functionality is actually pretty important for uh, some other software vendors that are expecting to be able to talk to an S3 endpoints, in this case Swift, and use some of those functionalities. So we're continuing to add that functionality. We'll be adding that plus, plus more um, in, in the months to come. The last thing that I wanted to talk about with the, uh, is kind of a recap from last time, kind of production experiences of what, have, what has happened, uh, is in the improvements in performance we made to some of the background consist consistency daemon processes. Uh, one of these would be a way that we were able to subdivide the work inside of a particular single storage server so that we keep all of the hardware more active without getting bogged down into one particular slow device. So it's common to have dozens of hard drives inside of a single storage server. And when that happens, it turns out hard drives are slow and uh, they tend to start to break before they actually break, uh, which means that uh, the way we used to be doing something is essentially we would scan the data across the hard drives and see what, collect the work jobs to be done and then start iterating and processing over that. But uh, if there were some work jobs that were located on one drive that was starting to become very slow, then all of the other work would basically just pile up behind it and you would end up with this very hot spot inside of your uh, storage server by one hard drive using all of its possible resources that it has and all of the other drives being idle and not making progress on that other work that needs to be done. So the basic idea that we did here is to subdivide that work into smaller pools uh, up to uh, one pool for every drive. Um, oftentimes I've seen it done where it's closer to uh, one to three drives per worker now. Um, and this allows you to say that if there is a particular solo hard drive, the other work can, can continue to make progress and you end up seeing a lot of um, improvement in, in the health of the cluster, uh, or it just is able to stay healthier better. But um, I've got an example of this improvement on improving the health of the cluster uh, here. This is a picture of, a, of, of some metrics we were collecting off of a Swift cluster. And so let me describe what's going on before you can see what, what really happens. Uh, as, as with most status graphs, red is bad, green is good. And uh, you can see that this started out with a lot of bad. What this is mapping is, uh, I, again, apologies, I haven't gone into a lot of detail on this today, but uh, on the storage, on, on the data placement algorithm inside of Swift, we place uh, things in partitions of the namespace, like an internal namespace uh, so that it's distributed throughout the rest of the cluster. And we can look and we can query that partition placement. And so uh, a, a, a drive will have some su subset of the partitions assigned to it and a different drive will have different ones. In the case of a failure, partitions are written to another location. So for example, in a three replica cluster, every partition will have three primary locations. That's where they're supposed to be according to the placement algorithm. And if one of those hard drives dies, then it's going to, the, the data that was on there is distributed throughout the rest of the cluster. And uh, when that partition is placed onto a non-primary location, we call that a handoff location. So basically, this is mapping a particular cluster and how many partitions are in their primary locations versus how many partitions are in their handoff locations. You want the red to be gone. You don't want red. So one of the first questions you should ask when you see something like this is how did it get so bad in the first place? That's, that's a problem. We need to fix it, but how do we not get into that circumstance in the first time? And sometimes, honestly, it's just unavoidable. And, and I have to be clear that having handoff partitions is a normal and expected part of running a Swift cluster. It's just part of what it does for capacity expansion, for, uh, for failure handling, and things like that. So um, this doesn't mean anything's broken. There's no client impact on this sort of thing. It just means that operationally you're, you need to resolve this problem. There's a lot of work to be done in the background. So this cluster got into a pretty bad shape uh, with regard to the handoffs because the operators had done a very large amount of hardware changes, which means that essentially things that were just content to be right here on this drive are now supposed to be assigned someplace else as new hardware is added. 
uh, as older hardware is removed and uh, you have to work around that failure. And so essentially we just, you get a lot of uh, handoff partitions just from that. But in addition to doing all of those hardware changes, they were also doing quite a bit of ingest. It was again, uh, some, an import of uh, data from, uh, I think it was from an older Swift cluster. They were moving out of that data center or off of that old hardware or something like that, moving into a different uh, uh, storage system. And at the time that this was taken, this is approximately a six petabyte cluster. So uh, sort of small to medium sized cluster. The, uh, so that's how they got into this big uh, circumstance. And I know it's really hard to see around, along the bottom there, but we're, we're looking at uh, on the far, on the far uh, left hand side, uh, that is July, uh, July 16th. And then uh, the far right hand side uh, is about a week later, it's uh, July 22nd. So this, this whole time frame here is not, uh, not really that long. And you can see that they added the, uh, uh, they, they changed, the, they, they took advantage of the new changes that we made with the uh, different concurrency pools uh, on somewhere around July 20th. And so you can see they were largely in a steady state of not making progress on these handoffs despite things working very quickly. Uh, on July 20th, they implemented these new changes and you can see that about two days later, they were pretty much gone, which was just massive, massive improvement. And as someone who works for a company that uh, does support quite a few Swift clusters, our support guys loved this change, that they can now uh, uh, adjust some uh, config settings for a customer and know that problems that have been plaguing uh, people for months will all of a sudden be resolved in days. So this was a massive success uh, for uh, seeing some of these backend changes and seeing that they're making measurable and uh, uh, massive improvements for the life of the operator, the health of the cluster, and ultimately the end users. Um, so it's, it's great success. So I guess in summary of those three big things that we did last time, we, uh, we've been using them in production and all three of them have been extremely successful. And it's all good news, so that's great. So. Let's talk about some of the new stuff that we've had since then uh, that we have added. Uh, one of the big things that uh, we have done in the last six months is uh, improving uh, some of the interfaces and support for encryption. So if you remember that Swift does support at rest disk encryption uh, or data encryption, and what this, uh, the, the threat model that we're specifically targeting is when a data, a hard drive is removed, a data uh, drive is removed from a storage node, it is safe to, you can, it's safe to RMA it. You can, uh, the data that is on there, the user data that's on there is encrypted. Um, that is the threat model that we are specifically protecting against. So there's a lot of people that really like this sort of thing. They don't have to worry about uh, isolating those hard drives, not putting them back in other servers that are being reprovisioned if the hard drive turns out it's fine or something like that. But um, to do that, we, uh, we, had a, um, we had two ways that uh, you could implement this. One is basically in a configuration file, you set what the master key is for the cluster. Um, and you were able to, uh, that then, uh, using some key wrapping techniques, uh, there were, there were uh, derived keys for all of the things that are encrypted. Um, and the other way is you could use uh, the Barbican service with Castellan library and uh, use that for your secret storage and uh, to store the key over there. So that's where we were. Uh, the things that we have done, uh, we have added are two things. One is that uh, using Swift without the Barbican service, you can now talk to directly to a KMIP endpoint. Uh, uh, it's one of the major protocols that key management systems uh, are, are use. And so you can, direct, you can talk directly to a KMIP server um, without having to worry about uh, also installing and managing Barbican. And the second thing that we added is the ability to support multiple encryption keys over time, which means that you can now introduce a key rotation policy. So that was one of the big problems is you, uh, uh, you, would, you would set the key, but you could never change it. And now it is possible to essentially add more keys. And uh, the, the most recent key is the one that is always used. Um, old, you still have to keep the older keys around because you want to be able to decrypt the older data. 
And the reason you can't just re-encrypt things is because in a storage cluster, you've got lots and lots of data. So if somebody is managing a cluster, they put 10 petabytes of data in there, it's all encrypted, and then they say, I want to rotate the key, you can't really read 10 petabytes off of the drives, re-encrypt all of that, write it all back onto the drives in any sort of reasonable time. And so you don't. You, you start using all new data as encrypted with a new key. Um, and so the key, this, this multi-key rotation functionality works with both uh, the Barbican key master and also talking directly to the KMEB services. So I'm pretty excited about this. I think it will enable uh, some other use cases and people who would uh, previously considered uh, Swift and chosen not to use it because it was not able to uh, support this key rotation functionality. One of the other things that we worked on over the last uh, six months is improving our testing, uh, the way to hunt and find for bugs automatically. And especially during the uh, PTG in Denver a few months ago, we spent uh, most of that week, in fact, improving uh, a lot of the automated testing that we do. A lot of this has been around uh, taking advantages of new features in Zool v3 which means that all of the test definitions can now be inside of the Swift repo itself without having to uh, be someplace else. And the main benefit of that is that the Swift contributors, who are the best people in the world to actually know how to test the Swift code, do not have to uh, find out how to manage and get approval from other teams to write a test definition for coverage inside of the Swift project. We can easily, as part of implementing a feature in a patch, uh, define a new test job in our own repository and it lands with the, uh, with the patch itself. Which means that the best people in the world for writing the tests are in, in fact now responsible for maintaining those test definitions and it will automatically be picked up as soon as that patch lands and uh, run throughout uh, the, the amazing work that the infrastructure team does and uh, the Zool team does with that project. So the few uh, interesting tests that we have added uh, is uh, in the, we've, we've had uh, a set of tests in the past that uh, simulates multiple nodes. So we, we take one VM and then we you know, mount four loopback drives instead of one drive and uh, we're able to test some handoff failure kind of sort of things and we simulate four servers on there and you, know, you shut one down. It's, they're kind of fake because um, they're all on the same virtual machine. So we have introduced multi-node tests now so that we are uh, standing up, um, I believe it is, it's a, it's a five node cluster. One is for a test runner. We have one proxy server and three storage nodes. Uh, so this kind of configuration lets us do some very interesting things, which leads to one of the other uh, things that we're now able to automatically test for in this, in this uh, multi-node test is an automatic rolling upgrade test so that we can, um, if I remember correctly, it, um, it installs the previous version and it then upgrades the, uh, the previous version will have already been pass, uh, passed functional tests uh, from the fact that it would have done, had to do that to be the previous version. Um, we will upgrade the storage nodes, uh, then we will run functional tests, and then we will upgrade the proxy uh, node and run functional tests and ensure that all of that continues to work. Um, it's something we have long held to that an operator should be able to uh, upgrade to any version of Swift uh, at any time that they choose without breaking any sort of backwards compatibility, definitely for the user, but uh, if at all possible, also for configuration options and things like that. Uh, and being able to have this as part of the actual gate testing um, just gives us one extra level of confidence to say that, yep, this has actually been uh, going through uh, some automated testing in addition to the code review that also looks for those sort of things. And we've also added uh, another set of tests that we don't run on every single patch, but we can uh, uh, run, uh, say, on every release. And uh, we don't run it every patch because it is going to be rather expensive and uh, has the possibility to get uh, uh, to be a very large scope. And that is the ability to have historic version compatibility testing. So it's not just the previous version, but now we can say uh, the past stable releases up to and including everything. So. Um, you should be able to take a version of Swift that was released in 2010 and upgrade it directly to the version of Swift that was released most recently, which is 2.19, and you will, it will work. So uh, we have the, uh, we've added some more functional testing for making sure that that looks great. The last big thing that we've been working on is Python 3 compatibility. Uh, it is a long, slow process, um, fraught with peril and uh, risk for introducing extra bugs. 
Uh, most of the hard parts have to do with the fact of bytes versus Unicode strings and understanding how that actually works. Um, there's problems with some serialization formats that work in one way but aren't deserializable the other way. And so when you have to deal with being able to read data that was written years ago, um, you have to make sure you're not introducing uh, subtle uh, encoding bugs or even crashing bugs that when you try to deserialize old data, it, um, it breaks. So um, I, I've, I've heard before and I've said before a few times that the most important thing a storage system can do is store your data. That should go without saying. Uh, but the second uh, most important thing, a, uh, or, or that means that the worst thing possible you would think a storage thing could do is lose your data. Um, the, that's not actually true. The worst thing possible that a storage system can do is corrupt your data and say, here is your data, but it is actually not your data. And uh, it's those sort of things that we have to be very cautious about, uh, which is one reason why the Python 3 compatibility is taking a long time. So as we all know, uh, the Python community is end of lifing support uh, in approximately 13 months at the end of the uh, 2019 calendar year, beginning of the 2020 calendar year. Uh, so uh, it turns out we have some nearer term deadlines than that. Um, all of the major Linux distributor, uh, distros are uh, going to be by default shipping Python 3 only uh, in their upcoming releases if they're not already doing so, which means that uh, it is, um, doesn't mean that Swift is automatically going to break, but what is uh, really problematic is when your dependencies start breaking and are not able to have bug fixes and um, are introducing, well, yeah, it, it's just, it's a whole complex group of an entire industry basically trying to move forward and we're, we're doing our part there. So those are basically the things that have been happening in the last, in the last three months. So do you have a, can you forecast an ETA for Python 3? Uh, the question is can I forecast an ETA for uh, Python 3 compatibility? Uh, the, the timeline that we are working under and that we have talked to the technical committee about is uh, meeting the technical committee's uh, goal of by the end of the T release, the train release now, um, we should be able to run under Python 3. So, speaking of the community, uh, I like talking about what's going on uh, in the community. Swift uh, developers are the best people I've ever worked with, uh, an amazing group of people. Uh, I've talked about the, some of this in the past, um, and I've got graphs that I make all, all the time about kind of what's going on in the community. And it's interesting tracking that over now uh, going on nearly nine years of history in the Swift community. Uh, kind of, you can see when companies uh, come into the community, when companies leave the community. And as we know, over the past uh, few years, there have been, in all of OpenStack, not just Swift, there have been several uh, very large companies, and large by a number of individuals that they're uh, essentially assigning to work on a project, um, have, have fallen away from the community. Uh, and that's, Swift has been hit by that as, as well as many other projects. That being said, uh, looking over the past 12 months, which is what this is showing, we are more or less stable, which is good news. Um, we, there may be a slight decline, but basically we are looking at approximately 15 to 20 unique active, active contributors every month. That's where we are on that. Uh, it does introduce a slight amount of risk uh, for the future of the project, and this is something I think that most projects in OpenStack are uh, coping with. Uh, but a smaller team does introduce more risk. It makes it uh, more difficult when um, uh, Someone, even an individual, but uh, much less a, an entire company, uh, pulls out from the community, it has, an outs it has a much more of an impact than, say, when we had 50 active contributors every month. Um, and so uh, it's something that I am paying a lot of attention to, I'm talking with people about, and uh, one of the things that keeps me up at night. Is there any list of companies that uh, involved in Yes, is there any list of companies that is involved in Swift? There is, and I normally include their logos of at least the major contributors uh, in, in, in these slides, but I, I just didn't this time. Uh, the major contributors to Swift right now, companies, and this is not to exclude people, but just kind of off the top of my head of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, Swift Stack is a major contributor. OVH is spending a lot of time uh, contributing to Swift. Uh, Red Hat is doing a little bit of con contribution as well as SUSE. And NTT is uh, still actively involved in contributing to the project. So those together are uh, making up 
um, essentially the core of the companies who are still involved in the, in the SWIFT project. So looking ahead, uh, we have some interesting work on, on the road, on the horizon. Again, very, very large work in just the level of effort it takes, but also the impact to the, to the overall design of the system. Uh, two of them I wanted to highlight uh, here. Uh, one of them is uh, something is called uh, LOSF, or lots of small files. Uh, essentially, it's a way to optimize the on-disk storage for small files. Uh, Swift is pretty good with uh, dealing with data, uh, data sizes of, or file sizes of all types, uh, but it's vastly different when you say, I have a billion one, ki uh, one kilobyte objects versus saying, I have a million thousand kilobyte objects or a billion one or you know, a mil uh, thousand hundred megabyte objects. It's, those, those are going to be relatively the same in number of bytes, but uh, they're very different operationally in how you deal with that. So uh, OBH is leading some uh, very interesting work on how uh, to change the on-disk layout for objects to optimize the storage for small files so that uh, there is less, um, less overhead of storing those, tracking those. Uh, it should improve the overall um, functionality of the background consistency demons, replication, reconstruction, auditing, things like that, things that have to walk the drive to make sure the right data is in the right place. Uh, so I'm excited about that work. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention that is uh, an ongoing piece of work that I've uh, mentioned in the past is uh, something we're calling a task queue, uh, which is an internal uh, system so that we can uh, more easily scale out work jobs that we find in the system. So for example, one way that this may be used is a future, uh, a future piece of functionality that would say, I have all of my data stored uh, according to one storage policy, it may be replicated, and I would like to migrate that to not change any URLs or anything like that, but I would like to make that into a erasure-coded data because it's, for, for whatever reasons you want to do that, um, could be performance reasons, could be storage capacity reasons, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, so a task queue would be able to take this work and then fan it out to essentially the entirety of the cluster if necessary, and uh, keep, uh, keep track of or keep make, making progress on that rather than being bogged down on a single server or a very small number of processes. Another way that we're looking at improving uh, things using task queue is with expiring objects. It's possible to write a data, uh, data into Swift and then uh, say after 30 days have it automatically deleted. And, uh, but if you think that I have a cluster and I'm only going to store, say, 30 days of data, and everything that comes into it is going to be deleted after 30 days. Essentially, after 30 days, you've literally doubled your request rate into the cluster because you have your normal ingest, but now you have delete requests that are automatically generated. So being able to track that and understand, uh, or take care of that, that additional uh, object expiry work is something that can uh, take advantage of the task you work so that um, more of the cluster can participate in that and you don't get bottlenecks operationally. So that being said, I believe there's a couple more minutes left, and uh, I would love to have anybody uh, who's interested to come get involved. There's plenty of ways. There's plenty of bugs. There's lots of big features and small features uh, where you can make a difference. So thank you for your time. Do we have any questions? All right, then. What is the best way to make feature requests in Swift? <laughs> Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise, in the community, you just come to the chat or... or so... <laughs> uh, maybe right here, right now, is not the exact best place in the world to do that. Uh, but the there, there are a few things I would say. One is getting involved talking to people is, is one way. So IRC is a great way to get involved. But a feature request, um, it could be added into the Launchpad bug tracker. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's also a wiki page that we have that is linked in the uh, channel topic in, in the OpenStack Swift free node channel uh, called Ideas. And uh, the, I, the, the basic rules about that, the only rule is if you have an idea, write it down so that you can share your thoughts and ideas, even if it's just requirements, uh, and then link to it. So write it down and link to it. That's it. And it issues all of the complexity of dealing with a review process on specs or... Uh, getting buried in a, a task queue or a, a, a bug, bug tracker or something like that. Um, so write it down, link to it. I don't care where you write it down, just 
make it linkable, and then on the ideas wiki page, uh, which it's, it's the OpenStack wiki, and I believe it's uh, Swift slash ideas, probably with a capital S and I. Um, and but but the link is in our uh, RC channel topic. But that's the best place to do that. But I'd love to talk to you after as well. That is correct. So the question is about, uh, or you had. Is there a plan to enhance that to make it automatic? Or? It's a great question. So with container sharding, um, the, the 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 comment uh, is that it is entirely correct that container sharding is not done automatically right now. It's not automatically enabled. Uh, we intentionally did not add that functionality to start with. It is operator initiated. So an, an operator needs to. Uh, through their own monitoring and metrics, which Swift does plenty of reporting on, uh, identify that here's a large container and then initiate sharding for that container. Um, so the question then, which is entirely appropriate, is when are we going to make it automatic? And that is a good question. I don't have a time frame answer for you other than to say you're certainly not the first, first person to ask for that or to want that, and it is something that we are looking at. Um, I doubt it's going to be something that we rush to. There are some other things that uh, we're looking at that's uh, either already ongoing or uh, may have, for various reasons, different prioritizations, higher prioritizations. Um, the, the main technical challenge with uh, automatically container sharding is designing a way to have all replicas of the container data converge on the same answer, because you don't want something to be sharded in different ways. And so essentially, although I don't really like to go into this, this realm, you, you need some sort of consensus-based leader election sort of thing. Swift is an eventually consistent system, so the idea of adding in a Raft or Paxos or some other consensus algorithm is, is a bit, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit almost psychologically new um, to be able to say, should we add that sort of thing into Swift? And the answer may be yes, but the answer may be there's other ways to do it and better ways to do it. Oh, awesome, awesome, okay, so. So I was worried that if I do it without operator, something gets corrupted. Right, so, uh, the, uh, so if you're writing a cron job to do that already, number one, um, go ahead and do that. You're going to write that way faster than we're going to write automatic container sharding. Uh, but number two, um, the, the hint on that is essentially you as the operator choose your own leader based on whatever you want, maybe a coin flip, who cares. But as long as you choose one and only one and then initiate sharding there, then that data will very quickly get propagated to the rest and then it will be able to um, uh, distribute the work out and, and work really well. So is there anything else? I believe we're at full time. Great. Well, thank you for your time. Okay. We'll, we'll, we can talk here or out front afterwards. Thank you.